Wow. Do, 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 do. You did it. it. So that was fast. Recording. Okay, sounds good. Um, our guest speaker tonight is Eric Dicing. He's a watershed ecologist for the Clinton River Watershed Council. And he'll be talking about restoration of the Clinton River watershed area of concern, a history of investment and current progress. Um, generally, um, the topic is going to uh, talk about the Clinton River watershed, which covers 760 square miles of southeast Michigan and boasts many unique natural resources. But it wasn't always this way. We will discuss the efforts put forth by regional partners to begin to enhance and restore the ecosystem that's the Clinton River. Um, Eric joined the Clinton River watershed as an environmental scientist in 2016 and was promoted to watershed ecologist in 2018. He graduated from Oakland University with a bachelor's degree in environmental science with a specialization in natural resource sustainability and management, as well as a biology major. Eric has completed level one and two river morphology classes with wild land hydrology, graduated from the Michigan Lake and Streams Leader Institute, and is currently pursuing a master's degree in biology at Oakland University. Let's have a hand for Eric. Yay, Eric. So you can see everybody's hands moving, so I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will, let me try and share my screen again. Eric, you're famous in Warren from the coal tar information <laughs> that resulted in an ordinance. Thanks again for that. Yes, thank you guys for actually following through with that. That's uh, that was a big endeavor when we f first started going through that process. So right. <clears throat> okay, can you all see that? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all um, for having me tonight. Um, it's an honor to speak to you guys tonight, and especially about everything that's been going on in the Clinton. This is kind of my bread and butter that I do at the Watershed Council. So it's always great to be able to relay all of this information um, to our stakeholders throughout the watershed. The one thing that I will say is I'm always very informal when it comes to my presentation. So at any point, if anybody has any questions or anything, feel free to chime in. Um, we're going to be going through quite a bit of information. So at any point, you can also ask me to slow down or anything else. So. Thank you, and let's go ahead and get started. So first off, I wanted to give you guys just a general lay of the land. Um, so this is the Clinton River watershed along with the Anchor Bay subwatershed and Lake St. Clair direct drainage. So the black outline there is essentially our service area uh, as a watershed council. So we serve the entire 760 square miles of the Clinton River watershed as well as the Macomb County portion of Anchor Bay and the entire Lake St. Clair direct drainage subwatershed. So within this area, we have roughly 73 communities. We also have over 1.5 million people that live within our boundaries, making us the most densely populated watershed in the state. Uh, we always go back and forth between us and the Rouge with that title, but since it's my presentation, I'm gonna say it's us for tonight, so. Um, our watershed can be divided up into seven sub watersheds within the Clinton itself. Each one of those sub watersheds has its own tributary. So we have the Upper Clinton, the Clinton Main, Clinton River East, the Red Run, Stony Creek, Paint Creek, the North Branch, and the Middle Branch. Um, those are the major ones. And each one of those sub watersheds has their own different hydrology and their own different characteristics that leads to different management decisions as we're trying to preserve the habitat in this area. So the first thing I wanted to kind of touch on is the diversity that we have in our watershed. So the uh, map that you see on the upper left is the Clinton River watershed alone without direct drainage in Anchor Bay. And those circles indicate the different types of land uses that dominate those different areas of the watershed. So we, our watershed extends through four counties. Uh, we cover about 50% of Oakland, about 95% of Macomb, and then we have little corners of both St. Clair County and Lapeer County that all drains into the Clinton River. Um, and each one of those areas is dominated by different types of development. So in the southern half, it's very, very developed, very urban, um, lots of impervious surfaces, 
And then once you start moving north, that changes a little bit. So in Oakland County, the upper left side here is kind of the suburban area. Still heavily developed, but in a different way, if you will. There's a lot more green spaces, a lot more wetlands in that area. All of our inland lake chains are in that area. That's also where the headwaters of the Clinton is located. And then as you go over to the right, the North Branch subwatershed and pieces of Stony Creek subwatershed are very, very rural, very much agricultural, not very developed at all. Um, so we kind of run the gamut across that whole spread of different land uses. And one of the one of my favorite images is actually on the bottom right here. And it really tells the story of what's going on in the watershed. On the left, you can see the main branch of the Clinton River, which actually runs underneath the city of Pontiac. Um, it goes into a pipe on the west side of Pontiac, and then it comes out from underground on the east side of Pontiac. That is the definition of development. Um, they literally put the entire river into a pipe and put it underground. Then you contrast that with the picture on the right, which is the North Branch. And the North Branch is that very agricultural and rural area. So you can see there's a significant floodplain there, significant riparian zone um, on both sides of the river. And then it's dominated by agriculture. So with a watershed like ours, it makes restoration work and protecting the ecosystem very challenging because you have to take into consideration each one of these pieces from working with the natural resources and the ecosystem itself to working with the stakeholders and the residents who live within the watershed as well. So back in the 1980s, 1987 to be specific, the United States Environmental Protection Agency listed us as an area of concern. So all throughout the Great Lakes, watersheds are listed as an area of concern if they do not meet the beneficial uses designated to that watershed. And we were determined to be an area of concern because we had these eight BUIs or beneficial use impairments assigned to us. The one thing that was very unique about the Clinton is most watersheds that are designated an AOC they have a specific stretch of river or a, a specific lake that's designated as an area of concern. In our case, it was our entire 760 square miles that received the designation. And the entire 760 square miles was given the eight beneficial use impairments that you see on the right here. So through that process, once the US EPA put us on this list, it kickstarted things within the watershed. And the Watershed Council and all of our stakeholders came together and formed the, the Public Advisory Council, which formed in 1989, to help to identify areas where we could make improvements, or essentially how we could go about addressing each one of these beneficial use impairments in order to delist us from the area of concern list with the US EPA. So through that, back in about 2014, um, when Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding came online, US EPA was able to direct fund $20 million worth of restoration within our watershed boundary. And we were able to leverage some of that funding to help us pull some additional grants and things like that. So to date, uh, the restoration investment in the watershed is well over $40 million. Um, and that number is continually climbing as we continue to develop projects. So one thing I want to point out here is that you see there on the right, um, we have officially removed our first beneficial use impairment in 2020. Um, the degradation of aesthetics BUI is no longer, um, that one's gone. So that's the first of the eight that will be removed by US EPA, hopefully in the coming years. Um, I'm going to touch on that a little bit here in just a second. So when EPA sent that $20 million um, into the watershed. And I should, I do want to make it clear that that $20 million did not come to the watershed council. That money was divvied up amongst the individual property owners. So most of that money went to the municipalities where the projects would take place. Um, but when all that money came in, these bullet points that you see here were the long-term goals that they wanted to see happen with that habitat investment. 
Uh, the original project list that was developed by the PAC was over 100 projects long. Um, a sub working group of the PAC was able to whittle that down to 17 very impactful projects. And then finally, US EPA agreed to fund 11 of those projects moving forward. And the pictures that you see here, I wanted to take a little bit of a step back and talk about what the river was like years ago. Um, actually, the picture on the bottom is from 2014. Um, I'm sure most of you were aware or probably in the area when we had the large flood event of 2014. Um, and we still deal with flooding to this day. The picture on the right here is of an area of the Clinton back in the 70s when a lot of areas along the river were actually used as illegal dumping sites. And that's actually two full-size vehicles um, that are in the river there that you see. Um, the degradation of aesthetics BUI came, kind of came out of that issue. The fact that a lot of people were using the um, solution to pollution is dilution idea and just kind of dumping everything in the river. And if it's not in their area, then it's gone. Well, that's how we got the de degradation of aesthetics BUI. And the project that took care of that BUI was the St. Lawrence Cemetery Project in Shelby Township where they went in and they were able to completely remediate an illegal dumping site and reinforce the bank there so that we wouldn't have any more pollution issues coming off of that illegal landfill at the time. <clears throat> I apologize, this, uh, this slide is not fun, but it's important. Um, so the, the projects that you see there on the left were the projects that received direct funding um, from US EPA. Uh, several of those projects also received funding from additional grants, uh, but for the most part, the bulk of that money came directly through the GRI funding back in 2014. All of those projects have been completed to date, um, with the exception of the Galway Wetland Project at the very bottom, and that is in the post-monitoring phase, um, but construction itself has been completed. And then in addition to that, on the right, you can see some of the projects that were done in association with the area of concern. So these are projects that we were able to get grant funding from a state source or from a private donor or a foundation in order to help us implement these different habitat related um, projects. And then finally, on the bottom right, you can see that there's a lot of things going on right now that are continuing to build on the progress that's already been funded. The Watershed Council stays vigilant in that we continue to try to identify and develop projects for future use. We have lists of projects that are shovel ready that we can apply for grants for. Um, and we're constantly trying to work with our watershed stakeholders um, from the state level to the county level to the municipality level to identify different areas and different opportunities that we can have an impact moving forward. So this is a map of the projects that have been completed um, associated with the area of concern work. Um, all of these, I believe, yes, all of these, as of this year, construction is done. Um, so the final piece for a couple of them is the post monitoring that will be done of the project. But for the most part, these are all complete. Um, and I will get into that post monitoring here in just a second. But the reason why I wanted to include this slide was to kind of show that we really, the biggest idea that we wanted to achieve by selecting these projects was that each area of the watershed and each sub watershed received some of that funding because there was areas all across the 760 square miles that needed attention. But in all honesty, $20 million is not enough to do everything that we wanted to do. So we wanted to make sure that it was spread out enough, but it was also connected enough that these projects could not only improve their central location, but improve the watershed as a whole. So I kept, in the past few slides, I was talking a lot about post monitoring. And this was the piece of the puzzle that was given to the Watershed Council. And this has pretty much made up my job since I was brought in um, in 2016. And what I was tasked with doing was each one of those projects that went in the ground we needed to collect data before, during, and after that project implementation to make sure that this investment, all this money that was brought in for habitat and wildlife work, was actually making a difference. 
So you can kind of see here some of the parameters that we use, but throughout from 20, about 2016 forward, I was out each and every field season collecting data from throughout the watershed connected to each one of those projects. And for the most part, this data was consistent with macroinvertebrate indices, habitat indices, and temperature monitoring. And then we also had additional parameters based on what each one of the projects was trying to target. So for example, the spillway project, which I'm gonna highlight here in just a second, one of the main goals behind that project was not only to produce aquatic habitat, but also habitat for wading birds and waterfowl. So one of the things that we did for that project is we used a backy or a before after control impact design to monitor the avian community that was using the off channel habitats that they put in. So certain projects had additional parameters, but all projects were given the general macroinvertebrate habitat and water temperature uh, monitoring. And that monitoring, as I mentioned before, took place in 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and for some of the projects, 21. So we have a long-term data set to start to look at how have these projects affected the ecosystem and have we effectively changed any of the dynamics within the watershed as a whole. So with that, I will pause here for just a quick second and take any questions on the kind of background information that I gave. After that, we're going to hop in and take a deeper dive into a few of the projects so you guys can actually see what this restoration has looked like at a site scale. Anybody have any questions right now? Okay. Are you working with getting rid of any of the invasive plants along the shoreline? There we go. Yes. Yeah, so invasive species treatments and removals were a part of every project that was funded. Be able to hear you. Oh. Okay. Uh, Eric, when when you talk about uh, aesthetics, um, the reduction or removal of of aesthetic degradation in that one particular case. What, can you describe what it was that, that was remediated? I mean, are we talking bank erosion or like refrigerators sticking up above the water surface or, or what it was that was fixed? Yeah, it, it was the latter. Um, so oh. aesthetics applied to the idea that the river historically was used as that illegal dumping ground. So it was the idea of identifying and remediating any of those illegal dumps that was eroding into the river. That was the oh. St. Lawrence project in Shelby. Um, and then in addition, the Watershed Council took on the role as providing um, citizen science programming to help continue to clean up the river. So part of that removal was we've established the Keeping It Clean program, which is housed within the Watershed Council. And we do weekly cleans where we clean up different areas of the watershed every week, every Wednesday. We also do four yearly trash runs in canoes where we go down the river and pick mm -hmm. up trash as we go. And that's kind of the ongoing next step component to the removal of that. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, um, I'm interested in the uh, water chemistry, especially PFAS, because uh, we live close to the Oakland County Airport, and I was wondering if there was any, uh, you know, any PFAS getting into the Clinton River, like the Huron River, you know, is contaminated with it. If you, when you do the ke chemical analysis, what, what do you check for? So for, for my monitoring, because my monitoring is directly tied to wildlife, fish, and habitat stuff, so my water quality parameters consisted of conductivity, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, total suspended solids, total dissolved solids, temperature, things like that. Oh, um, PFAS okay. is highly regulated by the state. Um, so they handle right. all of that testing. <laughs> well, um, uh, between you know. Eagle, EPA, and USGS, they do most of the PFAS, E. coli, um, that yeah. type of contaminant work but okay. if you're you you said you live right next to the Oakland County Airport correct yeah about a mile or two south yeah we're okay, right so along the, uh, 
I think a real clean stretch of the Clinton. Up by yeah, the, you guys, you're in the Upper Clinton sub watershed. That's a, it is a beautiful stretch. Um, yeah. But lovely. what I would, I would recommend at the very end of this presentation, you'll see my email come up. Um, shoot me an email if you have additional questions on PFAS and such, because I've sat in on a lot of the committee meetings from the watershed uh -huh. when it comes to PFAS. The okay. one thing that I can tell you is from the past two years of Eagles PFAS monitoring, our levels are not even in the same conversation as what happened in the Huron, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, we've been a lot more fortunate when it comes to the PFAS issues. We do have some hot spots but it's not anywhere near what's happened over there. Eric, could you uh, possibly tell everyone what a PFAS is in case someone might not know? Yeah, so PFAS stands for a family of compounds um, that comes from, well, for the most part, it comes from firefighting foam. So the foam that they use on runways and things like that to put out large scale fires at airports. And one of the um, bigger areas of concern in our watershed is Selfridge, Air National Guard Base. Um, and it kind of, it came about, it kind of came to light about two years ago with what happened in the Huron when there was a water treatment facility that was putting significant amounts of PFAS into the water, contaminating the fish and things like that. Um, and from that, the state ego formed the PFAS task force and that task force has taken on the responsibility of monitoring and cleaning up the PFAS contaminated areas. Um, so hopefully that gives a kind of brief background on what we're discussing. Eric, one more thing. <clears throat> um, I've been involved with the project salt watch from the uh, Isaac Walton league. And I think that might fall within the realm of the materials that are important to the um, micro and macro invertebrates that, that you're tracking. Has, has uh, Clinton River Watershed Group, you guys been doing any kind of salt monitoring or as, as a result of uh, MDOT crews or different uh, road crews in the wintertime who throw so much salt on the road and it gets right into the storm drains? I'm wondering if that's been something that's on your radar. Yes, actually, we've been involved with the Salt Watch program for the past two and a half years now. Um, we do the chloride monitoring through our Adopt-A-Stream program. Um, Adopt-A-Stream is a citizen science program where every year we send out about 300 volunteers uh, to monitor water quality throughout the watershed for us. And through that program, we've implemented the Salt Watch test. Um, and then all of our results, we compile them in-house for our own data needs. And then we also send them out to the Isaac Walton League. Okay, I'm, I'm wondering what kind of levels you've seen in the stretches of river you've looked at. I've looked, uh, I've been monitoring near the Irwin drain in the lower Clinton and haven't seen readings off the scale. There were a couple of times where it was, you know, something that you would note, but nothing that looked excessively horrible, at least according to the analysts at Isaac Walton. Yeah, we haven't seen anything that's really thrown up a red flag yet. Um, that's kind of the beauty of using our citizen science programs to collect the data yep. in that we, so adopt a stream, we send volunteers out to monitor in the fall, first weekend in October. And then we monitor again in the middle of January for our stonefly search. And then we pull another round of data in the spring, first weekend in May. So we're really, we're capturing reference conditions before the snow falls and there's no salt on the roads, right in the middle of it in January and then reference conditions after all of that snow melt. So we've seen some peaks in the chloride levels in the spring um, as to be expected after that snow melts and all of that salt runs into the surface waters. Right. But it hasn't been anything that's really thrown up a red flag to the point to where I would be overly concerned about it. Okay. <clears throat> hey, Eric, we have a question in the chat. Um, from Vicki, uh, just asking how, um, how you get your funding. So the Watershed Council, uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, we're based in Rochester Hills and our funding comes from a variety of sources. So for the most part, we're based on individual and business government membership donations. Um, in addition to that, we do uh, pursue grant funding both at the state and federal level. And beyond that, it's all private donations from individuals who live within the watershed. Hmm. Um, and it's because of all of their support that we're able to do the work that we do.
Okay, so I will continue on with some project highlights here um, and answer questions again at the end. Um, I'm sure we'll have a bunch, especially after we dive in deep to some of these projects here. So the first one up is actually the Clinton River Spillway Habitat Restoration. Um, so for those of you who may know where the Clinton River Spillway is, it's it cuts off right at Shadyside Park in Mount Clemens. And this spillway was originally dug back in the 1950s in order to alleviate funding or funding, alleviate flooding out of Harrison Township, Mount Clemens and Clinton Township. Um, and when the Army Corps dug the channel, it's a massive channel and it's just a massive two-stage ditch essentially. So there was no consideration put into habitat work within the channel at the time. So when the GRI funding came in, um, what we were able to do with roughly $4 million is they put in these five off-channel wetland areas um, that act as nutrient sinks and sediment traps from the water that's coming down the spillway. Um, and then within those areas, they also included some very crucial habitat components that included these large wooded debris complexes that you can see in this picture. Um, the island complexes that serve for water, waterfowl habitat and turtle habitat as well. And then it was the entire project consisted of invasive species treatment, removal, and then replacement with native vegetation throughout the entire reach. Uh, in total, there was about 106 total acres of restorations and, and invasive species control. Um, and that's continuing on to this day out there. Um, as you all know, invasive species is an ongoing process. Um, it's never something that you can really stop. Uh, but this is one of my favorite projects actually that happened in the watershed. And I think the reason why is because it took something that was made years ago that didn't have an ecological purpose and it gave it an ecological purpose. This was more of a habitat creation project rather than a restoration in itself. <clears throat> The next one is Galloway Creek. Uh, this is up on Oakland University's campus uh, running through the golf course. And this one was a very interesting project. Uh, as you can see in the picture in the top right, there was significant mass wasting going on, meaning that the banks were eroding away at a very high rate. And then you can also see in that picture those three concrete blocks. And those three concrete blocks are actually the foundation of a consumer's oil pipeline that's going through there. And the river had eroded below the pipeline, exposing the pipeline to the elements during low flows. So this project was a little heavy handed, but there was cause for it. So they actually went in and they moved the entire channel off the pipeline, recreated the habitat within the channel, reconnected the floodplain, and then are working right now with the native vegetation replacements throughout the golf course. Wow. Uh, in total, there was over 2,700 feet of tow wood structure put in and over 1,000 feet of log riffles that were added to the system as well. Um, and this is it was very cool. Last year, I was out there doing some fish surveys. Um, and we found significant patches of rainbow darters in the system. Um, and it had been years since we had seen rainbow darters out there. So this is a really, it's a cool project. Um, and it's kind of the first step in the restoration of Galway Creek along the university's property. Hmm. The next one is probably one of the largest projects. This is the Clinton River Corridor. This project came together as a partnership between the city of Sterling Heights and the city of Utica. Um, they came together to kind of piecemeal an entire nine mile stretch of the river into a single project. And it was, it was a $4.5 million project. And this is the project that allowed us last year, um, for those of you who may not be aware, the Clinton River was designated as a state water trail or a state paddling trail. Um, and this project was one of the reasons why we got that designation. So through this project, they removed 25 log jams. And when I'm talking about log jams, I'm talking about acres of log jams that had built up in the river. Uh, they removed all of those jams they replaced a lot of that large woody debris in log vein structures, which provides some pool riffle habitat, as well as protecting the bank and alleviating that mass wasting that you can see in the bottom picture here. You can see the before there was, the erosion was actually threatening the trail system through Dodge Park and Sterling Heights. 
And one of the things that they were able to do is using that rock vein structure, it helps to divert those flows back into the fall web or back into the deepest part of the channel while also providing some habitat um, benefits. So this project in total reduced an estimated 230,000 tons of sediment entering the system annually. Um, this is also a really cool project because like I said that oh. the work started down by Rotary Park area in Clinton Township and worked all the way up um, past Jimmy John's Field in Utica um, in different positions of the river throughout there. Um, there's still work to be done out there. I know there's some areas that are eroding away pretty quickly, but um, it's a great first step. And the other piece of that was is that we were able to have plans and engineering put together to address all of the areas of erosion through there. So that's an opportunity in the future um, to go after additional funding to complete this project out. Next up is Harley Ensign. Um, this is the Harley Ensign boat launch, DNR boat launch at the mouth of the Clinton River on Lake St. Clair. Um, this project uh, was very much an invasive species project. Um, anybody who had been out to Harley Ensign before they did this knows that that entire peninsula was just a sea of Phragmites and about nothing else. Um, so what they did is they went in, removed all of that Phragmites, treated and removed it. They cleaned out the ponds there um, that they had in the peninsula and created the 11 acres of wetland habitat, uh, all with native plantings in them. Um, and then they also replanted all the upland areas with native vegetation as well. And then the really cool piece of this project was is they did some things that were very cutting edge. Um, they sunk some large woody debris deep into the area of Lake St. Clair right around the peninsula, effectively creating some large woody debris habitat for fish. Um, and they also did a sig significant amount of aquatic plant plantings. Um, so Cardinal went out there and planted a bunch of uh, native aquatic plants to help to boost that wetland um, feel out in the lake itself. This one is a more recent one to be completed. Uh, this is the Clinton River in Shelby Township running through Riverbends Park. Um, and this was a $1.7 million project that restored approximately one mile of riverbank um, this is a huge erosion area. We were seeing, once again, significant uh, mass wasting on the outsides of the banks. So you can see in the picture on the left here, those little, they look like little piles of wood along the bank. Those are root wads. So what those do is they stabilize the bank while also providing habitat to macroinvertebrates um, for within the root wads themselves. Uh, Underneath all that sediment that you see there in that picture, there's about a 10 to 15 foot tree buried in the bank. And that's what allows that soil and sediment to hold in place. Um, and root wads are very stable for upwards of a hundred years. Um, so this will help to solidify that bank while also providing some habitat too. And then one of the really cool parts of this project was right by the disc golf course in Riverbends Park. On the bottom picture where the red arrow is, they put in an engineered log jam with an oxbow. And the oxbow was already existing at the time, but there was no log jam there. So they put in these pillars and tied in some large logs into those pillars. Oh. Last time I was out there, you could actually stand, I don't recommend this, <laughs> but you could stand on the logs and look down and just watch dozens of fish underneath those logs. It, right. it was incredible. <laughs> Hey, Eric, can I, can yes. I pause you for a second? Yep. Um, uh, Connie had asked, uh, actually, in, in the last project you were talking about, just a question about how, like, how do you get rid of Phragmites? So the Phragmites treatments, um, probably specifically talking about Harley Ensign, um, the Phragmites treatments at Harley Ensign, what they did is they came in, Cardno um, came in with a full treatment plan, and it was multi-phase. So they came in and they sprayed it, with the herbicide and then they mowed it down and then they burnt it. So they actually effectively killed it and then physically moved it and then burnt it to get rid of the biomass. Um, and burning is actually a really important restoration tool. Um, as that fire goes through, it re-germinates the native seed bank. 
and that's been actually most effective within the watershed. Um, there's another prairie actually right by our offices in Rochester Hills. Um, the city burns the prairie behind us and it's beautiful. Um, it's been very effective in controlling invasive species. I put a link in the chat for you. Okay. So this next one, this was a project that we just did actually in 2020. And this one was done in association with the area of concern work. So this was not a direct funded project. We identified about five years ago at the Yates Dam. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Yates, Cider Mill and Rochester Hills, um, the river runs through Yates Park and then right next to the Cider Mill. We identified a bypass channel, if you will, where the river had actually carved out a small channel around the dam that would allow it to connect the lower river and the upper river, which normally is fine. And for about five years, it was fine until 2020 happened. And you can see in this top picture, the channel actually opened up wide enough within a single spring that the entire river was rerouted around the dam. Um, the picture on the top right is the former riverbed that it was now dry when the new channel opened up. And the dam picture that you see here on the left was the Yates Dam when there was no water flowing over it for about three months. Um, the reason why this is an issue, I get lots of questions on this and sometimes I fight myself on it too. As an ecologist, the number one thing when you think about dams is they all need to go. We need that connectivity. We got to let fish up the system, that sort of thing. The biggest issue with this particular project was the Yates Dam is the terminal barrier for sea lamprey coming up from the Lake Erie Basin. Ugh. And above the Yates Dam, all of that area is essentially protected from sea lamprey pressures by the dam itself. So Fish and Wildlife Service was able to come to the table through the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission and was able to fund a project to repair that bypass channel and redirect flows back over the dam. And the picture on the bottom you can see is a root wide bank that's been newly constructed in 2020. Um, it's holding very well and there is flow restored over the dam itself now. Um, so this is a big undertaking, lots of partners at the table, uh, the Watershed Council, Fish and Wildlife Service, Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, DNR, Eagle, everybody came together to pull the funding in kind of an emergency situation um, in order to restore this area. There was a few years back, Paint Creek was actually treated for sea lamprey. Um, the thought was is during some of the heavy flooding that we had, some of the lamprey were actually able to get over the dam. And Fish and Wildlife Service was quoting that at about $300,000 every five years in order to keep the lamprey out of the upper clan. So a one-time investment of this magnitude means a lot to the health of the watershed as a whole. So I will pause there before I get to the last piece of the presentation here. Does anybody have any questions about the individual projects? Um, this is by far and by no means all of the projects. This is just kind of a subset um, that I picked out to show you guys tonight. Eric, I've got a question about the mechanics of, of putting in habitat. Sure. Uh, when, when a tree falls in from the bank, I'm, I'm assuming that very rarely does it fall, fall in completely orthogonally at right angles to it. So you made a point that like if it's angled such that water rushing against the fallen trunk redirects flow towards the center of the stream, <clears throat> that's a good condition. But if it falls in a way to where onrushing water would hit that trunk and be directed towards the bank, and cause scouring and erosion of the bank, that's, that's the bad thing? Yeah, and there's, okay. there's definitely a gray line there. Um, so you, typically when you're putting in an engineered log jam or a log vein, it's the, the tree is angled at a 45 degree angle against the current. Oh, really? And then it, yes, against the current. And then the, um, the end of the tree is actually some, not cemented. It's usually done with either boulders or um, duckbill anchors into the bank so that it won't move. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, large woody debris is a very, very, very good thing for a river. Um, and that, that's a very hard concept to communicate because yeah. we, 
we obviously want the river to be accessible and be able to be paddled and stuff like that. But in the same sense, there's areas in the state of Michigan where they're actually purposely felling trees into rivers to provide fish habitat. Okay. So large woody debris is crucial for the river system. Just in a very developed watershed, we have to make sure that those trees are angled the right way so that we're not causing any property damage or mass wasting, things like that. Interesting, thank you. Anything else right now? I have a question. Sure. Would you please explain again about the lampreys going over the dam and how and how what was the issue there and how was it held back and I don't understand what happened was the dam eroding and they were getting through so the idea was is at some point sea lamprey were able to access paint creek um, paint creek is super high quality habitat for those of you who don't know um, paint creek is one of the last remaining designated trout streams in southeast michigan um, starting from Lake Orion down to Rochester, it's huge trout fishery through there. Um, and with that amount of available habitat, sea lamprey loved it for breeding. Um, so what had happened in the years past is we had some very high flows um, and flooding events where the river, there was access around the dam right adjacent to it. That lamprey could actually swim up around the dam and get to those breeding habitats upstream. Um, and what had happened is the sea lamprey were identified in Paint Creek back in those years. Fish and Wildlife Service came in, went through a couple treatment cycles and were able to eradicate them. Hmm. Um, this project was back in, well, last year in 2020 was more of a preventative project. So when the river rerouted around the dam, they had a 30 foot wide highway to the upper reaches of their clan. So by blocking off that passage and rerouting back over the dam, we're preventing them from getting above that area. Does that help to clarify a little bit? A little bit, yep. Okay, and <laughs> once again, my email, it will be at the very end of this presentation. Okay. For anything that's unclear or you want more information, I would highly encourage you to send me an email. Um, okay. I can actually send you pictures and engineering plans and stuff like that, that'll make things a lot clearer than me trying to blabber on and explain it, so. <clears throat> hey, Eric, th this is Garrett here. Um, are, are there any, uh, are, are there any tribal communities that, that, that are working uh, with the, the Clinton River Watershed Council, um, just as kind of ongoing partners with some of the work that you're doing? Not currently. That's something that I have been exploring recently. Um, and I would love to connect with the tribal communities um, from our watershed area. I think that's an area where we need to grow as an organization. Um, and it's definitely an untapped partnership. So if, I, if yourself or anyone else has any connections there, please do send those to me. Um, we're really trying to reach out to partners that we haven't in the past. Um, Recently, we went under a full regime change. Um, we actually had 100% staff turnover about six years ago. Um, and the new staff that's coming in is trying to expand our avenues um, that we had before. So I would be very interested if anyone has any information on that. That's something that I would like to do in the near future. Yeah, I appreciate you hearing, like, hearing that, 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 um, that receptivity on, on your part. Uh, you know, when you were talking about, um, particularly, I'm looking at this, you know, this picture of the Yates Bypass Channel and, and seeing the, the, these, you know, really dramatic pictures of what the, the riverbed looked like after sort of like the, the change in course. And, and I'm thinking about all of the, um, you know, the, 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 there's like incredible knowledge that you're sharing about like the observation and the study and, and, and you know, all of the work with the river and even, you know, like the, the understanding of like a, a, a good angle for like the, the log jams and, and the tree trunks we placed in, in the river. And it was making me think of um, something I read not long ago. And, you know, my, my understanding of, of, you know, like the indigenous history of the Great Lakes is so elementary. Um, but but I, I was reading a little bit about um, with the Odawa and, and the, o, like, like family groups along rivers in Michigan you know, um, from the Odawa, 
you know, sort of managing the, the trade that would go up and down these rivers, you know, um, in the, the lower peninsula area and, and just the, the, the really sophisticated and like, you know, age old sort of like chain of relationships among families that go from the mouth of the river all the way up, you know, the river into the interior of the peninsula, um, you know, and just imagining the, the, the rich and the deep sort of relationship with the flow of the river and everything that, you know, that river meant to that piece of the peninsula, um, you know, that was just, must have been so ingrained in like the, the, the culture and the life of those, Ad the, the, the Adawa and the families, you know, along that stretch of river. It was uh, incredible yeah, to yeah. imagine, you know? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I'm also interested in doing is finding out, um, how we as a watershed council can recognize the indigenous peoples um, that had this land and make their voices heard in some of the projects that we do in the future. You know, if there's something that we can target that they are very passionate about, that's something that I would like to explore. So um, yeah, like I said, if anyone has additional information, please send that out to me. Oh, thanks, thanks for, um, for those thoughts, appreciate it. Anything else real quick at the moment? I'm hey, getting Robert. very close to the end, so. Real quick question. Where does sure. the Clinton River begin? So it begins at Independence Oaks County Park in uh, Oakland County. It's oh. up in uh, Independence Township. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's as close as we can get to where it begins. Um, there's a lot of small tributaries and wetlands above that, but that's where the bulk of the water starts to flow downhill. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so lastly, I just wanted to touch on some of the things that we're looking at now. So at the very beginning of the presentation, I showed you some pictures of um, the historical illegal dumping and what the river looked like when it was flooded over and all that stuff. Well, I wanted to show some of the successes that we've seen as well. Um, so I mentioned just a minute ago that Paint Creek um, is a very vibrant urban trout fishery, um, designated trout stream in Southeast Michigan. Lake St. Clair, as many of you know, is a world renowned fishery, um, warm water fishery. And um, we also have an urban steelhead run in the Clinton River main branch below Yates Dam. So we've come a long way, especially when you think about back in the 1960s, DNR did a fishery survey from the mouth of the river on Lake St. Clair to Pontiac. In that survey, they did not find a single living fish in the river system. Since then, we've come to have three distinct urban fisheries within our boundaries. And all three of the fish that you see here were caught in the Clinton River, um, the steelhead, the uh, brown trout, and the muskie. Um, the muskie, I actually, well, I can't lie to you guys. I electrofished the muskie out of the spillway um, during a fish survey, but I still count it on my little sheet. Um, 47 inch muskie, um, but the, these are awesome resources that we've seen starting to rebound um, since the work that's been done on the habitat as well as the Clean Water Act and everything since that was passed. Um, and working with non-point source and point source pollution and everything like that. When you're in a developed watershed with over 1.5 million people, it's very challenging. And there are so many stakeholders to bring to the table. Um, and I just wanted to highlight and kind of start to focus in on the positive things rather than some of the negative that we looked at before. Finally, some next steps. Um, so watershed-wide data analysis. So I mentioned all that monitoring data that we have from the watershed that revolves around these projects. Um, that is what is my master's thesis. Um, so I'm currently putting all that data together and running all the metrics and all the statistics on that data to try to detect if there's any differences that we've seen um, since these projects have been completed. Following that report, um, we will be working with US EPA and the state to continue to remove the remaining seven BUIs and hopefully be delisted in the near future from the area of concern list. And then finally, we're going through lots of additional project development at this point. So that's a really important thing that I want to say is, even if we delist as an area of concern, 
we as a watershed council still have a list of projects that we're looking to get funded in the near future um, to build upon the work that's already been done. And one of the biggest pieces of that is future data collection within the river and its tributaries to identify areas that may need some improvements or some enhancements. Um, so with that, I will answer any other remaining questions. Um, my email is right there right now because we're kind of working both in the office and at home, that's going to be the easiest way to get a hold of me. Uh, I would highly encourage anyone who's interested in anything I talked about tonight um, or wants to know more about the Watershed Council or becoming a volunteer, getting involved, um, please reach out to me and I will try to connect you to the right individual within the organization. So with that, uh, thank you guys. I hope that it was enjoyable. Um, and also feel free, I can flip back through the presentation if you guys wanna look at any of the projects a little bit deeper. I have a question. Sure. Uh, Eric, uh, what is the relationship between your work uh, in the Clinton River Watershed Group with commercial users along the water? Uh, I'm talking about in part at the mouth of the Clinton River, there's a ton of marinas, a few restaurants and so forth. Are they an obstacle or are they supportive? Do they make contributions? Do you solicit them? Uh, what is the relationship with those folks? And then also I, I notice every now and then there are some commercial uses along the river. There's a motel just uh, south of downtown Mount Clemens along Gratiot. It's right on the river. There's a restaurant in Rochester on Paint Creek just uh, off of Rochester Road and I'm just wondering, it seems like they potentially are resources that you could use or they may be a problem. And I'm curious as to what the relationship is. Yeah, for sure. So I'll start with the marinas and the, um, restaurants and such that are right on Lake St. Clair. Um, our relationship with most of those areas is developing and developing very well. Um, for example, the Anchor Bay Yachting Association, we're heavily involved with them. Um, we talk with them every single year and give them updates. They are a big contributor um, funding wise as well. And then we do a lot of public education with the marinas. We come out, give presentations. We help to support county efforts, um, working with the marinas, with the Clean Marinas program and things like that. Um, as far as businesses along the river, um, that's an area where we need to make some more connections. We have connections with several businesses. Um, and a lot of those businesses are very receptive to our work. Um, one thing that I didn't mention, Yates Cider Mill right on the river. We actually, we have a grant and this year we're going to be going in and restoring another 500 feet of the river on Yates Cider Mill property. Um, so that's an example of where the businesses stepped up to the plate and actually allowed us to do a project on their property and are also contributing funds to it. Um, so there's areas where areas of the watershed where we need to expand and then there's areas where we already have a very good relationship with our riparian property owners. Good. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, Eric, I have a question that I understand that is least, at least as much pollution is coming into the Clinton River from the 12 towns uh, drain that goes under De Quinder, uh, just north of 13 Mile as what comes from the Clinton River watershed itself. Is that true? And is there a chance of, uh, do you work to try to lower that amount of pollution coming in from the 12 towns? I'm not sure. So we do, we work very, very closely with both counties, um, Public Works in Macomb County and Water Resources Commission in Oakland County. Um, the 12 towns drain, so you're referring to Red Run. Um, the 12 towns drain is like the Royal Oak, Huntington Woods, Berkeley, that area as a whole. Um, which most of those communities are for the most part still on combined sewer systems. Um, Water Resources Commission in Oakland County has taken dramatic steps to reduce the amount of pollution that's coming out of the George W. Coon um, retention basin. And for the most part, they've been able to reduce at least even during storm events to where they hold that water back and it goes through, if not a full water treatment, at least a tertiary treatment. Um, but I think what we do to try to combat that in the red run for the, at least in the 12 towns area, because you can kind of separate it out. You have the 12 towns area in Oakland County, 
and then the Red Run receives water from the rest of the Red Run sub watershed from Madison Heights, City of Warren, Clinton Township, Troy, um, all those areas. So we try to one of the best ways to alleviate the amount of water that's coming out of the Red Run is green infrastructure. And that's been one of our target areas in that sub watershed is try to develop as much and as large areas of green infrastructure as we can. Um, most of the time that's via grant funding. So it can be kind of spotty. You know, we'll get a bunch of grants so we can do something and then you might not get a grant for a couple of years. But green infrastructure is gonna be one of the best ways to combat the amount of water that's coming out of the Red Run. Um, capturing that stormwater runoff on land, allowing for water to continually be fully treated and seek out the Red Run, and then releasing that stormwater afterwards. Um, that's been the bulk of our work in that area. Um, additionally, in the Red Run, I have been involved with the Sterling Relief Project um, that's going through um, Sterling Heights and Clinton Township. And that project is a significant green stormwater infrastructure project that actually received area of concern funding to start it. Um, and it's essentially turning an underground ditch through Sterling Heights and bringing it above ground and allowing that water to seek into the soil before it enters the Red Run itself. Um, we've done a lot of invasive species work on the Red Run and we're continuing to work with Macomb County Public Works um, especially in the coming couple years here to do some bank stabilization and try and reduce um, any mass wasting along the Red Run itself. Um, so it's, that sub watershed is, I mean, to be honest, it's an engineering feat. There's nothing else like it in the state of Michigan. Um, and the, I mean, cause the Red Run is not a natural system at all. It's been totally dug out, dredged out for the idea of moving stormwater as fast as you can. So to try to combat that, we're working with the green stormwater infrastructure and trying to work with Water Resource Commission and Macomb County Public Works to try to restore and stabilize as much as we can within the channel. Anything else? I have a question, if you have the time. Um, this is a little, it's different. Uh, in the Rouge River area, the Rouge River leaves Dearborn in that concrete whatever. Is that ever possible, possible to destroy that concrete and let the Rouge be a natural riverway again? I, whenever I see that, I think about that. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Is it possible? Yes, absolutely. Um, is it feasible <laughs> is another conversation. And the reason why I say that is because of the amount of money it would take. Um, actually, I'm glad you asked that question because that's similar to our Red Run situation. You know, the 12 towns drainage district. For both of those kinds of projects and repairing a system to that extent, you're talking billions upon billions upon billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard to do. Um, but ecologically, yes, it is absolutely possible. Um, you know, the simple solution would be to go in and remove that concrete channel. Mm -hmm. And you would try to replicate some of the natural geomorphology through that area, meaning maybe putting in some bends, some riffles, pools, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and eventually the river itself would rebound. Um, it's just the amount of money that it would take to do so and making sure that you're protecting the private property and interest at the same time mm -hmm. makes it very hard. Okay, thank you. All right, well, I will stop sharing here. Yeah, Eric, just uh, maybe you've seen in the chat, but a number of folks just uh, expressing their appreciation um, and, uh, and their enthusiasm for the presentation. So I'll echo that and just uh, thank you very much for everything you shared.
Yes, thank uh, thank all of you for your time and attention. And like I said, you know, feel free to reach out to me, the Watershed Council. We're here um, for our constituents. You know, we we are a nonprofit. We're not here to try to um, meet any agenda. Our client is the river and its tributaries. So please, if you guys want to get involved, reach out to us, um, and we'll we'll get you out there. <laughs> Thank you again, Eric. Not a problem. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. thank you. Yay, Eric. Okay, have a good evening. And folks, as you're as you're signing off, just a reminder: we're um, the, our monthly meetings. We take a break during the summertime, so uh, so that you can get out and maybe find a volunteer project uh, in the Clinton River watershed, or uh, get out and enjoy the river. Um, or some other great stuff like that in the outdoors. But um, we will see you all um, in September. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the meantime, have a great time and, and enjoy the great outdoors. Thanks, Thanks you all. Thanks, Jared. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Take care. <laughs> we should keep it. Oh, I was hoping Phil was going to stay on. We could have recorded. We could have recorded Phil's phone conversation and had that be the end of the the recording. Oh uh, darn! Yeah. Well, I guess I'll stop it right here. So, okay. Well, listen, y'all. See you later. Thanks, Jerry. Okay. Bye bye. Take care, everybody. <laughs>